So we, uh, kind of a, as, a, as a beginning of this whole uh, thing of going after more of God and seeing God move, I, I have a message today. I also wanted to clarify that, uh, excuse me. Everybody understood. Thanks for turning that down during that. Good job. <laughs> Ron's on it. Um, that everybody understands that this, uh, the reason that we're having just dessert and drinks, but it's uh, $20 a couple is because we have a, a nationally known, highly sought after speaker. So we could tell you his name and you wouldn't know it, but until you hear him, then you're motivated. So next year, our plan is to bring him in for a weekend retreat. Because one of the things that as pastors we struggle with is families and marriages that really struggle. And they barely hold on by a thread. And we need to do a better job of helping our marriages be really strong. And so I would urge you to get, get the ticket. Because what you're doing, you're not just buying a dessert. You're also paying some honorarium and the church is adding to it. Because this guy is not cheap to bring in. But he's worth every nickel. He's phenomenal. He's a terrific speaker. And so we wanted, we wanted to bring in the best. Uh, uh, River Valley, the largest churches in our nation, have this guy come to speak to, his, uh, to, to, the, uh, to the marriages uh, of their churches. And, and it's, a, it's a powerful event. So, so let's, let's fill that thing, get as many people in there as possible, and particularly uh, make, make sure let's do that ahead of time. We'll begin this message, and, and uh, it's called The Fear of the Lord. And... Uh, when I, when I say the fear of the Lord, uh, I'm not saying being afraid. How many of you are afraid of snakes? How many are not afraid of snakes? That's a little weird <laughs> in my thinking. I am absolutely frightened beyond measure, even if it's a garden snake. I'm hopping up on a chair and running. How many of you snake lovers are afraid of spiders? Yeah. Good. Glad you're afraid of something. When we talk about the fear of God, we're not talking about that. You know, in life, there's healthy fears, like staying away from a high, the edge of a high mountain, right? Or the fear of, of making your diet Coca-Cola and peanuts every day. That's going to kill you quickly. Um, there's a healthy fear that motivates us. And the, when I say the fear of the Lord... I'm talking about respect and reverence and taking God seriously, what he says serious and uh, seriously. And, and so um, in our culture, we've lost that. And as I look in this room, you know, it's really tough when you preach it yourself to preach. Okay? So just know I'm preaching to myself. But I'm also preaching to you. And to be honest with you, I don't know if there's anyone in our church, no matter what the leadership position is, even pastors, I'm sure there are some, so don't be offended, but I'm just going to say this, the fear of God is such an important thing that God puts in our heart, and without it, your life will not be what it needs to be. Your children's life will not be what it needs to be. Because this book is meant to be heeded. And God, while he's Savior, when he comes again, he'll be judge. And before I begin, I do not want you to misunderstand what I'm about to preach. I am not preaching you're not saved by grace we are saved by grace through faith. It's not of ourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works lest any man boast. But possessing the fear of God is something every true believer needs to have. If you don't take his word seriously and you're not respecting God as the authority, the one that made all things, that knows all things, that sees all things, that hears all things, then you're mistaken you're mistaken in your living. And the first thing, though, I want you to see is the fear of God is our friend, point one. He's our friend. That's our friend. And uh, a lot of people, when they hear the fear of God, it sounds more like an enemy. And it's something we need to get away from, not being afraid of God, so to speak. And so that's how they think of it. But it's not 
the fear of God apart from the love and grace and mercy of God. The fear of God are compatible with the mercy, love, and grace of God. They walk side by side. And when you've actually truly experienced that love and mercy and grace, the fear of God should increase. Because grace is not a definition word by which I put my theological formula together and I have an erasing and covering of sins that makes me get to heaven. Grace is the power of God that invades your heart. And when God lets you see and feel and hear as he sees and feels things and hears things and looks at things rather, then suddenly that holy fear will invade your heart. Person that has been changed from darkness to light, old things have passed away, behold, all things become new, becomes an individual that possesses as a gift from God the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is our friend. You can't even have faith unless God gives you a measure of faith as a gift. You can't believe unless God helps you believe. You can't just go, I think I'll wait someday, right before I die, get right with God, because God's Spirit may not call. And unless the Spirit convicts, unless the Spirit calls, unless there's an opportunity that the Holy Spirit is drawing you and is ready to invade your heart with His glory, then you can't just say, I'm going to apply the theological knowledge that I have or the formula that everyone has talked about that makes a person get to heaven. This is not about a formula to get to heaven. This is about a God that invades your heart and changes the way you feel, the way you see things, and, and the way you think about life. And the fear of God will give you that if you'll embrace it as a gift from God, as a friend to us, his people. Jeremiah thirty-two thirty-nine says it this way. I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for their own good and the good of their children after them. Notice the fear of God is meant to go on with his people. Notice that the fear of God is a blessing to his people, that it changes, gives one heart, the heart after God. That song, change my heart, O God, make it ever true. Change my heart, O God, may I be like you. You are the potter and I am the clay. Mold me and make me. After thy will, God, change my heart. That's what God does. I will give them one heart. God gives that one way that they may fear me forever. It's their good and their children's good and their children's children's good because it's forever. And may everyone who falls under the name of Jesus Christ fear God and take him very serious. Seriously or serious. Seriously, I think. Thank you. My daughter's back there giving me the English since she teaches um, language arts. She's a language arts expert, so I just make sure I get that right. It sounds wrong to me. Take God seriously. I just want to say serious. Be serious. Get serious with God. And I, that, two different things there, but that's what I'm saying. So I want to dispel this idea because this is a, this is a goofed up, modern lack of fear of God society, a religious society view in theology that is absolutely messed up. It's an evolutionary, evolutionary view of the Bible, which uh, is at the heart that says that ancient times, in ancient times, people had a primitive view of God. In the Old Testament, that is written from, from a view that's primitive of God, that he is to be one to be feared. But in a more enlightened times, people have come to a mature view of God and that he is to be loved. And that's a complete misunderstanding of what the Bible is and what the Bible says. God never changes. Jesus Christ, yesterday, today, and forever, we're to fear him as we love him. We are to love him as we fear him. The Old Testament is full of the love of God. Go read Deuteronomy, the book of Hosea, whatever. And, and you'll see that the love of God, his mercy endures forever, the psalmist says. It says, as far as the east is from the west, Old Testament, so far he removes our sin from us. Right? Well, you see the love, the mercy, the grace of God. The whole story of Noah is a grace story. It is not his will that any perish, not only in the New Testament, but the old, the law. And Jesus didn't come to do away with the law. 
In his Sermon on the Mount, he said he's come to fulfill the law, to dot every I and cross every T. Not that we're saved by following the letter of the law. That's not what he said. But now he's put the law in our heart, written on the hearts of flesh, the Spirit of God from an intrinsic knowledge of Jesus in us that we would live forth his glory and his light in his holiness. All throughout Scripture, you see where the Bible says it is will, and he foreplanned in advance, ordained in advance, that we should be the expressed image of Christ. In other words, his goal for every child of God is to be like Jesus. And without the fear of God, you will never reach that. But today we have this theology that says, well, everybody has a sin. Don't judge them. You aren't perfect either. And no one should be looking that way. You shouldn't look at someone else to justify yourself. You shouldn't look at them to judge them. You shouldn't measure yourself among each other. The Bible says it's unwise. You shouldn't do that. What you should do is look to a holy God and let his holy word, with illuminated by his Holy Spirit, cause you to become holy in the sight of all men, that they might look and say that God is truly among you. That's the key. So I want to tell you, one of the keys in what's wrong with our nation and the world is the religion without the power of God. Paul said in the last days, so Timothy told Timothy that in the last days, men will be lovers of themselves, proud, blasphemous, boastful, having a form of religion, but denying the power thereof. And there is a power of God that comes when we fear God in holy reverence and take his word and take what he says seriously. What parent is a good parent that doesn't carry that authority where a child respects their mother and father? That's what the scripture even says about mothers and fathers, that they take what they say serious. That's why you don't go, that's why in good parenting, you don't go, I'll give you a count to three. No, you either do it or you're done. If they understand it, you don't count to three. You teach them, you can get by with it as long as you can, and then you're going to get it. When I blow my top, the word says it, it is true. The next point besides that fear of God is our friend, the New Testament speaks often of the fear of God. It's not just in the Old Testament. Jesus himself, and he was talking to his disciples. Listen to me. He was talking to saved people. He was talking to his disciples when he said this, okay? And he was talking about his Father, which was in heaven, his God. And Jesus said in Matthew 10, 28, Do not be, be afraid of those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather be afraid of the one, he's talking about his father, who can destroy both soul and body in hell. When there comes a day when God himself divides the sheep and the goats and says, enter in, or says, I never knew you, depart from me. That's straight from the book of Matthew when Jesus' words in the Sermon on the Mount, I never knew you, depart from me. There are people that will think they're okay with God because in our culture, religion is so dummy down to formulas, so dummy down to tell people that it doesn't matter how you live as long as you believe. But trusting is not just believing. Trusting is trusting and obeying and following after and pursuing and wanting and desiring God and having right relationship with God. Yes, Jesus does it. He puts the fear, he puts faith in your heart. He puts grace in your heart. He changes your life. But don't believe the lie that fear and the fear of God is not an, a New Testament concept. It absolutely is. And again, I want to emphasize, because I feel led by the Spirit to say, I'm not saying you're afraid of God, because God wants you to be close, and he's your friend, and he's your, the lover of your soul, and he's merciful, and he's good. But what it's saying is respecting and taking everything about him seriously. Everything. The command of fear is in the New Testament, 1 Peter 2, 17. Peter writes, show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. That was written to Christian believers, guys. Hebrews 10, 30 to 31. Jewish Christians in the early church, the Hebrew believers, that's to Hebrews, to the Christians that were Jews, it says this, for we know him who said it is mine to avenge, I will repay. It is not up to you to get back at someone. The, the biggest problem in America is a lack of God inside us that is who we like 
to say God is merciful, forgiving, and gracious. We love that when it's at us. But when it's expected to be God in us toward others, we don't so much love it. The Bible says, leave it alone. I've got this judgment myself. It's not up to you. It is mine to avenge. I will repay. And again, the Lord would judge his people. Whose people? His people. Is that, is that, is that heathens? No. That's the believer. He's going to judge his people. It's a dreadful thing to fall in the hands of a, into the hands of a living God. You know, there is a righteous anger of God. And you spit at him. You call his name. You say something, and yet you, 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 your words are, are blasphemous. That's why blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is such a horrible thing, that you, that you speak against God, yet in the same mouth, out of the same mouth comes the other side of your honors and praises to God. Throughout the Old Testament, new alike, it mentions a person's uh, words being cheap, and they have words of love and words of faith and words of praise, but their hearts are far from me. Fearing God was a mark of the early church in Acts 9.31. It mentions they were walking in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy, church, Holy Spirit was with them. And the church was multiplying daily. When you see God do miraculous things, it makes you respect and realize this is almighty God. This is not some chump neighbor God that you snap your finger and treat like a genie. This is an almighty God whose word is final and a full and full of authority. Jeremiah 5.22, the question, do you not fear me, God says, declares the Lord. Do you not tremble before me? You see, people who do not fear the Lord have not seen the glory of God. Isaiah, a man of faith, a prophet used of God, suddenly saw the Lord in such a way that I want our church to see God. And Isaiah 6 records Isaiah seeing it. He says, in the year the king Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, seated at the throne of the throne. And the train, or the glory, of it, the train of his robe filled the temple. The Lord's glory filled the temple is what it's saying. And above him were sorts of angels, it says seraphim, each with six wings. Two wings, they covered their faces. Two, they covered their feet. And with two, they were flying, and they were calling to one another. And notice the triplets, because it's always extra emphasis when it says it three times. Holy, 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 they were saying. Say it with me. Holy, holy, holy. Out loud, say it with me. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And at the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me. I am ruined, Isaiah said. I'm a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Let me tell you, most every one of you in this place are lacking in the fear of God. I'm looking at you. You can get offended if you want to, but it's true. You're lacking in the fear of God. America, even in the best churches, are lacking in the fear, the respect, the honor, the position, the taking God seriously position. He goes on. Isaiah says, then one of the seraphim, this is the good part, flew to me with a live coal in his hand. See, God... When suddenly you see God, you see his glory, you repent, you cry out, I'm unclean. You admonish, you admit it, you ask for God. He says he flies the seraphim to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken from the tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, see this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin paid for, atoned for. And that's what this is about. That's a forecast and a foreshadowing, a projection of the future when Jesus Christ would go to the cross and paid death for your sins. You see, your sin and my sin has to be paid for with blood. There's no forgiveness of sin without the shedding of blood. Every sin has to be paid for with death, both in the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. It's the same. In the Old, it was imperfect sacrifice of animals, spotless animals, but they had to do it over and over to pay for sin. But then there came one, a sinless one who was born of a virgin, who lived a life sinless, who did many miracles, who taught and preached the way we should live. He died on the cross. He suffered. He 
would pay a great suffering, suffering, hurting sin for our sins. He died on that cross for our sin. He paid the death that we should have taken for our sin. And then he was buried, but the third day he rose victorious, and he lives among us. And let me tell you something, he can speak to you. And the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is here and can be in you, so you don't have to play the, oh, well, we're all human card. No, God, when Jesus would heal people, he would say, now go and sin no more. He didn't say, go ahead, because I understand you're all weak. Yes, he understands the infirmities. He understands our weaknesses. He realizes it, but he provides the living word, anointed by the spirit he provides his power his resurrection power in us that we are not weaklings we're mighty to God to the pulling down of strongholds by the spirit of the Lord in us we are full of the power of spirit that we might be witnesses to this generation and to all people and we don't have to be weaklings and excuse our our earthiness and our sinfulness and our depravity on the fact that we're just human and God understands because everybody sins no he doesn't understand And people throw the Old Testament out and say sins of the Old Testament aren't mentioned in the New Testament, and they're baloney wrong. They're baloney wrong. They're wrong. Sin is sin. It's always been sin. And what's mentioned as sin in the Old is sin in the New. There's no difference. Don't be mistaken. And the grace of God is in the old, and the grace of God is in the new. The love of God is in the old, and the love of God is in the New Testament. The mercy of God is in the old, and the mercy of God is in the New Testament. But that does not mean that we shouldn't walk full of God, and full of His power, and full of His Spirit, reverencing and respecting and fearing God. And it's not easy when you preach it yourself. So there's judgment. There's judgment that God, he came as a savior. He's coming back to judge. And the Bible says in the New Testament, this is judgment and fear. The fear, respect of God, taking God seriously is in the New Testament, not just the old. For it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 10 and 11, for we must all, this is written to believers, for we must all, all of you, look at me, all of you here, we must all bef- appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That's to judge the, the, the saved, those going to heaven. Let me tell you something. I don't want to face Jesus at the judgment seat of Christ and have him bring up things I've done and said and ways I've thought and behaved in the intent and motive of my heart, and he knows it all. So we better be careful. If every idol spoken he hears, he's going to hold you account for. Right? Because there's a lot of sin that goes on that's not the quote-unquote top ten sins of America that we point to as evangelical believers. There's sins... Of, of pride that deal with, with the relationship we have with others and jealousy and envy and unforgiveness that's all pride hatred judgment, racism uh, classism all of it sins of greed I'm going to tell you something. If you have the heart of God and you respect God, you take his word serious when it tells you about what you should give. And you don't throw out because you go, oh, oh, that's an Old Testament principle. Yeah, the tithe is an Old Testament principle. But in the New Testament, he says tithe isn't enough. You give from the heart, right? Just like it's not enough not to actually commit adultery. He says that the same thing. He says it's, 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 you have to not even have adultery in your heart. Even lust, it's the same sin. Moral sins are moral sins across the board. No matter what the sexual sin is, they're all equally wrong. And we stand up on our little pulpits and we judge the world around us and we don't listen or hear God or hear what God is saying to us and God is dealing with things in our lives, things viewed privately, things done privately, said privately. God sees it all. We need more of God, folks. We need the reverence of God. We need to take God serious. Paul said, as a believer, he writes Romans 8, 1, there's no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. That's true. That's absolutely true. He goes on and says, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. In other words, truly converted. That old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. Put off these old things. In other words, take some effort. Be serious about living for God in holiness. Put on the things of God. Take time for his word. 
He knew there was no condemnation as a believer, but he also knew that knowing him and being close to him involved taking God seriously, knowing the fear of God. And so Christians have a profound awareness that someday there's a, a judgment for believers, the judgment seat of Christ, and that Jesus knows everything about us. He knows the things that are hidden from others. He knows before God, whom all hearts are open and sees all things. He sees our intent, our motives, our desires, from whom no secrets are hidden. You don't even know yourself the full extent of your heart. Only God knows it. But just like you, just like me, just like Paul, we have to be aware that God wants to do something bigger in us than just limp along in a fleshly, carnal existence, barely scraping into heaven. That's not God's purpose. So why should believers fear the Lord as we think about judgment? First of all, don't ever forget where you came from. The judgment of God was once our due. Grace is not right. It's not a right. It's not our right. It's a gift. I deserve justice, and God gives me grace. So God is a God of judgment, but he, what I deserve was judgment, but he doesn't give it to me. Secondly, we still deserve judgment even after grace has made a change in our condition. In other words, if he just looks at his standard of perfection and holiness, absolute perfection, if you were going to get there on your good merit, no matter how close you get to God, you're not going to get there without the blood of Jesus. And then once you step out and you think you're okay and you've arrived and you're a certain level of holy and righteous and good, then God, the Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. It says that the only way we're going to get there is through the blood of Jesus. So don't step outside underneath grace and following and respect and fear of the Lord. Because remember, even though grace has changed us and changed our hearts and changed our condition and made a way for us to have a right relationship with God, we still, if you move that mercy and grace, we still are deserving of judgment. But God goes on. We're saved in a moment and we're continuously saved throughout life. And the third thing, the third thing is that we're still in process of being saved. I know I shall be saved, but it's a difficult thing to save me from my sins. What did the Bible say about, to Joseph about his son, Jesus? He said, call his name Jesus, for he will save their people from their sin. He didn't say call his name Jesus because he will wash away their sins. He will cover over. He will forgive their sins. No. He will save them from their sins. In other words, deliver you. And some of you have got sins, and you know it. And you know it, and you don't want to admit it. But in a minute, I'm going to call this whole church to this altar. And you're going to have to come up here and get right up here and just fill every inch up in here to stand before God as a congregation and say, God, we need all of you. And we, we have made a decision as a church that we're going to take you seriously and take your word seriously. You know why I know a lot of people don't take God serious? Because the, the New Testament, the New Testament Sabbath is Sunday. When Jesus rose from the dead on the third day, as Christians, we celebrate and we set aside a day for God and it's Sunday. And we don't, we're not, we're, we have no problem putting God on the back burner all the time. In America, your most faithful evangelical Christians will come to church about one out of three times a, a month. And that is not okay with God. And sports is not a God. And when we put sports and we put other things before God and before his holy Sabbath as a believer, we are sadly mistaken. You don't like me now, do you? I don't care what football game is on tonight. You realize the power of unity? Paul in every one of his letters talks about being together and being unified. Can you imagine if we all decided that we're going to be unified to go after God, to go after more of the spirit and less of flesh, more of the kingdom of God and, and of heaven and seeking first his kingdom and, and, and sitting and saying, and we all said, we're going to come here, we're going to seek God. If only a fourth of the attenders, even a, a fourth of the attenders came tonight, this whole place would be full. If we would go after God with all of our heart, seeking him and crying out, I'm going to tell you, you talk about more heaven coming, heaven's going to fall down. I want to see more of heaven. I want to see more of his glory. I want to see more of God. And I'm telling you, 
There's things that remain that we need to be changed from and daily needing of being saved from this little thing and that little thing and jealousy and unforgiveness and lust and whatever it is, whatever the minor things are, let God clean you up. And it doesn't happen unless you take God seriously in his word. Be ye holy, for I am holy, he says. Without holiness, no man will see God. Philippians 2, 12 to 15 mentions this process of salvation. And Paul isn't saying that, that you're not saved by grace through faith here. Obviously, he's the apostle of grace, right? He says, therefore, he writes to the church at Philippi, Philippians 2, 12 to 15, therefore, my, my dear friends, as you've always obeyed, not only in my presence, Paul says, not only because I'm there, but now much more in my absence when I'm not able to be with you, you Philippian Christians. Continue to look at it. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Fear. There it is. Taking God seriously. What does he say? And he says, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. You see, God's purpose is you be conformed to the image of Christ. I said it. And it's God doing it. But if we don't cooperate with it, if we don't take his word serious, if we don't put ourselves in the disciplines to open the book, to come together as a church, to pray for one another, to exhort one another, to be used by the gifts of the Spirit, to be the church on fire for God, then we're going to fall in into this low level of nothingness that is called Christianity in America. And it's only a form of religion, and it stinks in the nostrils of God. The Bible says in Revelation that, that, that lukewarmness makes him spit out of his mouth. There needs to be more. Now look what it goes on and says, talking about working out the salvation of fear and trembling. It goes on in Philippians 2. It says, do everything without grumbling and arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault <laughs> in a warped and crooked generation. That's where we are. There's a lot he wants to do in us, folks. And we need to be serious about the things of God. There's nothing self-righteous about a true, true Christian. We can be close to God. And the closer you are, the less self-righteous you are. The closer you are, the more honest you are. The closer you are, the more you cry out for more of God. The closer you are, the more love you have for people. The closer you are, the more merciful you are. The closer you are to God, the more forgiving you are. The closer you are to God, the more you want to see those that are in blind and lost and in the dark come to the knowledge of Jesus' love and salvation and light and truth. But if we are like the world, there is no salt and no light. And we're not going to impact the world. We're not going to do it. We need the fear of the Lord, a healthy reverence and respect, taking God serious. And then, then it says, and it balances it. This is the Old Testament, Psalm 130, verse 4. But with you, God, there's forgiveness that you may be feared. See that? Fear, forgiveness that you may be feared. You see, the fear of God that does us so much good arises out of the knowledge of God's grace, mercy, and love, his forgiveness. That's where it comes from. You see, listen to this. This is powerful. This is worth posting on the stupid internet. The love of God and how much it cost Jesus on the cross should make you say, how could I sin against a love like this? How could I sin against a love like this? That's the love motivating the fear of taking God seriously. To fear God is to love him so that, listen, you love him so much that the frown of God, the frown of God is your greatest dread and his smile is your greatest delight. God's smile becomes your greatest delight. A person who fears God is someone who's seen, like Isaiah, the glory of the Lord and I've seen it and I want it again. We live in an OMG culture. We're just filled with reality shows where people invoke the name of God to express their surprise when the reveal comes at the end. It strikes me of a symptom of how far our culture has gone from the fear of God. The Jews wouldn't even spell God's name, Yahweh, with all letters because they held God's name in such high esteem they would not even pronounce his name. In our culture, the letters G-O-D have absolutely no idea of the glory and power and greatness of God and the judgment or the love either of whom they speak. 
And if you're a believer, you call yourself a believer, I challenge you to make this resolve that you will demonstrate that you know something of God's glory and his judgment and his love. That when you speak the name of God or Jesus or Christ, you speak his name in a way that shows you fear him, that you love him, that you respect him and you honor him. Be careful. Will you make that resolve? Pastor Brett, would you come to the piano? And there are three applications right quick I'd like to give you. And communion is open to every one of you. It's not closed communion here where you have to be a member. If you're a follower of Jesus, you're welcome to receive it. And as you receive the cup, just hold it till everyone's been served, and then we'll take together in a minute. The first thing I want you to see is the blessing. The application is that the fear of the Lord is a blessing. Write these verses down, Proverbs 28, 14. Blessed is the one who fears the Lord always. You want to be blessed? Keep the fear of God. Take him seriously in your life. Secondly, fearing the Lord will give you wisdom. Psalm 111.10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Third, for the blessing, the fearing the Lord will keep you from sin. Exodus 20.20, 20. the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. God, help us. Help us sin no more. 2 Corinthians 5.11, the fear of God will cause you to to pray for and reach and witness and evangelize the world, your family, your friends, your neighbors, your coworkers. So since then, we know what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade men. Since we know the fear of the Lord, since we know what it is to fear the Lord, we know of judgment. We do our best to persuade men. There's blessing in the fear of the Lord. There's a promise. Jeremiah 32, 40. God promises, he says, I will put the fear of me in their hearts. Oh, just lift your hands and say, God, put the fear of me in my heart. Just say, God, put the fear of me, of you, God, in my heart. Put your fear, God, respect, honor. I will put the fear of me in their hearts that they may not turn from me. That's his people he's writing about. Godly fear in the hearts of his people that they wouldn't turn against him. They may not turn from me against him. And the clear implication is without the fear of the Lord, believing people can stray. And then the last thing, make this your prayer. And this is your memory verse. Write down Psalm 8611. 8611, Psalm 8611. Psalm 86, verse 11. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may, that I may walk in your truth. Reunite my heart to fear your name. Only God can put do that to your heart. We've drifted. We've lost it. And only God can do it. As we come before God, take his word serious that says don't drink damnation to yourself don't drink death repent examine your life let God speak to you then drink it with joy because his mercy is here it is grace and his forgiveness as those come to serve it we think of the cross on what Jesus died those that are serving would you come please quickly come and where it says this do in remembrance of me because it is about Jesus it is about Jesus.